simpler times. Okay. So we should be live in a second here. Great. Everything looks good. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Runners High, presented by Canada Running Series. Runners High is a collection of informal conversations with key and influential members of the world and business of running. My name is Kate Van Buskirk, and once again, I'm very happy to be your host for today's discussion. And just a reminder that, as always, Runners High is interactive, so you can feel free to leave your comments or your questions in the comment section on the CRS Facebook page, and we'll get to as many of those as we can at the end of our chat. And just before we get started, we want to remind everyone that registration is now open for the Under Armour Spring Runoff and for the Bank Scotia 21 km de Montréal virtual races. So head over to CanadaRunningSeries.com, find out what you get when you register, and you can start your training today. You don't want to miss out on those virtual race opportunities. So we're joined this afternoon by elite runner and coach and a good buddy of mine, Rob Watson. Rob has enjoyed a long and very successful career on the track, on the roads, and more recently, a foray into the world of the trails. He was a standout high school and university steeplechaser who eventually moved up to the marathon, representing Canada in that event at the World Championships. He placed 11th at the 2013 Boston Marathon and set a personal best of 213.29 at the Toronto Waterfront Marathon later that same year. Rob is now a head coach with Mile to Marathon Coaching, where he is dedicated to helping others achieve their athletic goals and foster a love of running. Rob's motto, and I love this, is be patient, remain humble, and do the damn work. And today we're gonna to chat about doing that work through one of the most challenging times of the year, the Canadian winter. Rob grew up in Ontario, and he spent time in university in West Virginia and Colorado, and he now calls Vancouver home. So he's lived and trained through a whole wide range of winter running conditions. And he is here to share his expertise on how to make the most of these cold and somewhat dark days. Welcome to Runners High, Rob. Hey, Kate, thanks so much. That was quite the introduction. The whole Did I get it all right? The biography of my life. Oh, you nailed it. I forgot about some of that stuff also. So, so that, was, that was good. Thanks for the reminder. Well, thanks so much for joining us. We're, we're glad that you're with us. And right off the bat, since we're going to be talking about weather, I'm sure folks can see that here in Toronto, we're, we've been blessed with some beautiful sunshine streaming through my window. But how are things looking in Vancouver today? We also have a sunny day here, which is kind of rare this, this time of year, but it's, it's when you get a sunny day in the winter in Vancouver, it's just phenomenal. You'll get like eight rain days in a row and then you'll get a day like today and be like, okay, okay, it's not so bad. Uh, right. You know, the, the North Shore Mountains open up and it's just spectacular as you can see the snow-capped mountains. And uh, so, yeah, we, we're lucky to get one of those bluebird days today. So I'm looking forward to getting out for a run a little bit later on. Awesome. And what, what kind of temperature are you working with? I... Uh, it was when I went to the store for coffee this morning, it was probably about three to four degrees, but I, I reckon it'll get up to like seven or eight today. I'm very jealous. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe I'm just speculating. It might not get that warm. I don't know. Right. I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there, but I don't know. It could. Well, for your sake, I hope that it does. <laughs> Thank that you. That sounds Me so too. nice. Yeah. Um, so let's just start off the bat, Rob. I want to kind of get into a number of these different pieces of advice that you have for, for nailing our winter training. But before we do that, obviously, things have been um, really tough for everyone throughout COVID. I'm wondering how life has been for you, both personally and as a coach during uh, the pandemic. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's been obviously challenging. Everybody has faced their own unique challenges due to this pandemic, which has completely got us blindsided a lot of people blindsided a lot of industries and just blindsided the world kind of um so it's you know what it, all things considered I've been very fortunate with the way you know COVID has affected my life um there's been challenges but they have been minor in in comparison to what many have faced so I'm very grateful for that um I'm very grateful to have my running as my outlet uh you know, it's not like I, I can't get in the gym and lift weights or anything. I can still go out for my runs, which is really nice. Um, yeah, so my wife and I have just been hunkering down in our home office and, and, doing, and doing what we can. But it, it, it definitely, it, I feel very, very fortunate at the lack of like big negative impacts. Um, obviously, our industry has been really hit um, with races and things like that. And I feel really bad for all the race directors out there. I know the grind that they've been going through. But um. Yeah, and I miss, obviously, I miss running with my group. I miss coaching in person with Mile to Marathon. But 
you know, this thing will go away eventually. And it's really nice to see people are still running. We have a lot of new runners now um, that I can't wait to, for them to go and experience the sport at its fullest and finest when we have races and community and all those vibes. Um, a lot of people are experiencing the physical, you know, the physical introduction to the sport. And I can't wait for them to also experience the community introduction. That unmute button is a sticky one. <laughs> That's great to hear. So what has what has running looked like for you lately, Rob? I know that, uh, again, you've sort of gone through this wide gamut of, you know, track roads yep. onto the yep. trails. Uh, what, what are some of your, have you been doing any virtual racing? What is training and, and some of your major goals looked like lately? Yeah. I mean, I like when you, you're saying in the introduction there, it's like, I've, I've covered the spectrum of running. Like I, I've raced anything from the 800 to a 50 K and, uh, so in 2020, one of my things was I wanted to continue to experience some like longer stuff. So one of my main goals in 2020 was to do a hundred kilometer run. I was hoping it was going to be in a race format, but uh, that didn't happen obviously. So, and you know, in the end of 2020, I just went out and run a hundred kilometers kind of solo to see what it was like and to experience it. And to, uh, you know, I've been, as I've got into more coaching, I coach athletes who run those longer distances. So I felt it was important for me to go and experience it myself and experience how awful it was and and how unique of an event it was and how unique of a physical and mental experience it was so that was one of my goals was to lean a little bit more into that um definitely i don't have the same performance uh you know standards that i once had uh but i still like to push myself hard i still like to work hard so you know, my goals are a little more less high end i guess you can say but i still i'm gonna i'm gonna run as fast as i can based on the level of training i can do and i always try to keep around you know like 110 to 130 kilometers a week is kind of a baseline to keep somewhat fit and then if i have something that really excites me i can aim my training towards that that's the good thing about running right it's like all runners will do the same basic work and like my thing is like i want to be like eight weeks away from like aiming that fitness towards a specific thing. So if like I have that 120 kilometer base, I can be like, okay, now I want to run a fast 5k. Six weeks of 5k training can run a fast 5k. But you can also take that base and be like, okay, in eight weeks, I want to run a fast marathon, aim it towards the marathon. So I like to keep a standard level of fitness. And then as I get motivated or excited about something, go for that. That's great. I think uh, that's something we'll probably chat more about as we get into some more of the nitty gritty about coaching. But I think that's a, a good sort of piece of advice in general is just maintaining that, you yep. know, base level of fitness and then being able to, like you said, tailor it to whatever you're getting excited about. That's great. Well, we're looking forward to hopefully seeing your name on some results as we move forward into some in-person races again over the next year. But first and foremost, again, right now we're talking about how we're all going to get to those races and how we're gonna stay healthy and strong through these winter months. So as we mentioned, you now live in what is relatively balmy Vancouver, but again, you've lived and trained in so many different provinces and states and cities where the winters can be really, really harsh. And so right off the bat, I'm curious what some of your most intense or sort of like badass memories are of winter training wherever they may come from yeah you, you, the most badass thing in winter training is, is is when you go for a run and it's icy and snow and you come home with the snow beard or the snow eyebrows or the snow eyelashes i mean there's no more badass than that right you finish your run you walk inside and your parents are like what are you doing you're like i'm just being a badass right um so anytime that can happen it was always it was always kind of like a badge of honor type thing um, but I, I, I remember, like, I remember when I was living in Guelph and training with Taylor, uh, Taylor Mill, and two-time Olympian, and we would go for these runs in like snowstorms and everything like this. And we'd go and we'd be like, we're like, we'll remember this day when we're on the track in May. We'll remember this day when we're racing in June type thing, right? Because the foundation you lay in the winter, it's going to be there when you race in, in the summer type thing. So I just, like, I can't remember specific days, but I just remember it's, icy and snowy and windy and the wind chills super low you got all your clothes on and you're trudging through the snow and you feel like rocky four climbing up the mountain you know but it's cool because you do you do feel like a badass and and and, and it reminds you how much it means to you and how much you want it because it's not necessarily going to be fun but when you finish you get that great sense of accomplishment and even in vancouver like you know for all the ice and snow there's something awful awful about running when it's two degrees and raining and it's just chilled to the bone and and you come home and there's you'll never have a nicer shower in your life than after you know you're really really wet from freezing rain so you go and get in that shower and it feels delightful but so even even when it's you know it's the conditions but i feel like 
you know, if you run 300 runs a year and three of them are awful, that's still only 1% of your running. So it's, it's okay to, it's okay to hunker down and, and get her done every so often. And the body and the mind is an amazing thing where we adapt pretty well. So you have your worst ever run and the next day is not quite as bad. It's like, well, it could be worse. It could have been yesterday type thing. Right. That's a great perspective. One that I think we all need right now more than ever. That's great. So, um, you know, you spoke to this already, but sort of that character building, <clears throat> those badges of honor that we accumulate through our winter training months, um, they, they count for a lot. But on the flip side of that, of course, in order to get good at this thing called winter running, we have to make a lot of mistakes along the way. So I'm wondering what are some of, you know, the, the biggest, let's say, missteps or mistakes that you've made over the years regarding winter training that you've learned the most from? Yeah, you know, you know what, I, th I think sometimes, um, and I'm guilty of this, a lot of runners are so reliant on metrics. Um, we want to run a certain pace, or we want to run a certain distance, or we're very numbers based, right? And a lot of times in the winter, those metrics can be unrealistic based on where you at are your with your training and also where you're at with with winter weather right if you go out on a beautiful day in may and you're in your shorts and you're in your t-shirt and it, you're on the track you can probably run off you're gonna have very little things affecting your performance whereas you go out there in the winter and there's a little bit of ice a little bit of snow you're wearing four layers right your performance is going to be affected and your times are going to reflect that so you'll see times like oh i wanted to run 10k pace it's like well that's not realistic, but I, I would fall in that. I would fall into that, that, that too. Right. You'd think you had a bad workout because you didn't hit specific times, whereas you killed yourself to get there. So it's like, you know what, the effort was there, hang your hat on that and know you're putting in a body of work. So I think a big a challenge in, in winter is can be too dependent on metrics, which is understandable because a lot of people, that's how you track your training, right? You'll look at what you did two weeks ago. So now this is what you're going to do. Right. And it's a progression in that regard. So it's being able to kind of cue in on effort and RPE and have a different measures and metrics of success of a workout um, or accomplishment in a workout and not be so numbers based, which a lot of us are, and that's okay. This is, you know, to be mindful of what's going on. Totally. Yeah. And you're right. I think even the most seasoned veterans fall into that trap frequently because we like comparing what we've done in the past to how we are now. And that's not always the most realistic thing in the winter. So that that's a great segue. And I, I want to get into some of that sort of adjusting expectations during these colder days. Um, but before we get there, you know, I'd, I'd like to maybe break this down into a few different categories around the all of the advice that you would have um, from the experience you've accumulated over the years. And I think the first one would probably be just getting out the door. So I'd like to start by talking a little bit about the gear, because as you mentioned, there's a lot of new runners um, who have taken up the sport for the first time during the pandemic, or maybe gotten back into it after years of being away. And, you know, we've all seen folks out on, you know, on their runs in um, sort of, you mentioned Rocky, like those bulky sweaters and sweatpants. And that's great because that's what people can get out in. But let's say you're a relatively new runner and you're looking to invest in a few good pieces of winter running gear. What are some of the main essentials that you would kind of guide people towards? Yeah, I, I mean, I would, I would know that winter running is all about layers. Um, layers can be very key because, you know, you just don't want to put on, you don't, you don't want to be warm to start the run, right? If you're warm to start the run, you're going to be sweating really, really bad to finish the run. And the worst thing is when you go for a winter run and you sweat early and then you get to your turnaround and realize you had a tailwind, you're now you're running into a headwind and all that sweat just gets really cold. It can be dangerous. I've had runs like that. Um, but anyway, so to uh, layers are key. And also just, um, I have, I have really bad circulation into my hands. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a glove and then a mitten type guy, making sure the extremities are covered, covering up your head. You don't want to be losing too much heat through your head. Don't want to be losing too much heat through your hands. And also a nice pair of socks. I don't think cotton socks are super good in the in the in in the winter time i think you know investing in some good things to cover up your extremities are a good place to start and also something to cover up your core so a nice i'm i think merino wool is the king of fabric uh but you know it's, it's not the cheapest so something moisture wicking especially against your body and it's going to thermoregulate your body because if you have all this great tech gear, but you're wearing like a cotton shirt on directly against your skin and that sweats, then that's going to be wet, right? So something technical, especially on the first layer to your body and then layer on top of that. Something wind resistant would be good. Doesn't have to be specifically a run thing. It can be anything that's going to keep you warm um, and, and block the wind. For men, the worst 
thing, the worst pain of it, like some of the worst pain I've ever felt in a run is when you, when you freeze your, your man parts and then, and that's an awful feeling. Right. And, and that's just, just, that's another extremity, I suppose, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so keep that warm. And, uh, so yeah, it's, it's all about layering, making sure you're, you keep your core temperature warm, um, keeping your hands and toes warm and, uh, yeah. And then have stuff, even like a neck warmer, you can pull it up or you can pull it down when things get, but just to start, you don't want to be hot to start, but you don't want to be too cold. Cause if you're too cold to start, you may never warm up type thing. So it's finding that balance. Right. And, and you, you mentioned it, but what's that called? Is it underwear that men wear the, the layer underneath that kind of keeps everything a little bit warmer? Yeah. I think, I think there's a few iterations and a few things out there, but yeah, I, I know that uh, some of them have like a wind blocking layer um, mm. right there. And, and they're not the most comfortable, but it's a whole lot different. It's a whole lot better than the alternative, I suppose. <laughs> I can imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah. Um, and then you had mentioned the the like the gaiters or the the buffs, and I've been finding those are great because I live in a condo, so I actually wear that as my mask to leave and come back in, and then I'm able to use it as something that'll keep my neck a little warmer while I'm out on the run. So hundred percent, hundred percent, a rebrand, right? And I, and we are living the challenging time, and even just that courtesy of you know, doing something like that. Right. And, and, and having, having that mask, you know, running on, running on super busy trails, even just showing that courtesy. I know out, so outside and whatever rates, I'm not going to become a scientist here. They're low, but there's also the perception of like, you know, doing what we can and doing what we can is, is wearing a mask when you're running. For sure. Yeah, definitely. Great advice. Okay. So what about the more, let's say you're, you're, you know, willing to go out on those colder, snowier days, let's say you've been in the sport a little longer, what are some of the maybe higher tech or higher end gear that you have found is really helpful as, as a marathoner during the winter months? Yeah. Um, uh, like I was, I mentioned before, Merino wool is my, my go-to base layer because it just keeps you warm and it thermoregulates really well. And then on top of that, it depends on how cold it's going to be, uh, a, a breathable, movable jacket of sorts that's going to protect you from from the uh from the wind um i live in vancouver i have a, a you know i have like different wet jackets for like if it's below freezing i'll wear this if it's like two to four i'll wear this if it's something light i'll wear this type thing but they all the same thing in common where they are uh somewhat water resistant breathable um and 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 but also move well with your body and and they're good for layering right so i mean i think most any leading sportswear manufacturer will will make something to fit that fit that i'm a huge fan of uh i, well, I work with lululemon so <laughs> i'm a lululemon guy and they're really upping their run game um they have really nice uh run pants the, the hybrid the surge hybrid is a great run pant where it's got a little more protection on the front and they're the back's a little more breathable and and you know moves with the body really well so um, just run specific stuff engineered by running companies. Um, a Nike will have something good and Adidas will have something good because they have specific lines dedicated to running. Um, and they, and, and I know from my work with, with Lululemon, they're like, we want runners to run in this. So we're going to design this off a runner's body type thing. Mm -hmm. So these yeah. companies put a lot into R and D to get a piece of that pie. So, right. Yeah. Great advice. What about footwear? Cause I know that's a big part of the equation too in terms of just making sure I think sometimes it's just about mentally feeling like you have a little more security and maybe a bulkier or a, a you know more tread on on a set of footwear yeah you know having having like I have trail shoes because I do trail running but when it's when you have a little bit of ice a little bit of snow it's, I'll throw in a trail shoe because they have those lugs right they're a little more aggressive you can't run as fast as them because they don't feel as fast and they're just not engineered to go as fast but a trail shoe on a little bit of a little bit of like especially when, you know, you get that like hard packed snow, which can be a little bit, little bit like slippery, having a shoe with a lug in it can go a long way in, in just being able to get that traction. And when you have that traction, you feel a little bit more secure and you can put a little bit more effort in. Um, so yeah, like a, like a, a runnable trail shoe is good. I have an, I have a Pegasus trail that I really, really like because it's kind of the Pegasus upper, which is more fast and sleek, but the, it has some, has some lugs. I wouldn't call them super aggressive lugs but they're there and they add to the traction so when i want to jam when it's kind of crappy i i, I find that to be a good shoe um, everyone has their own feelings on gore-tex shoes um, i'm not a huge fan of gore-tex shoes i find that i just sweat from the inside out rather from the outside in so I, I find them to be a little hot but again to each their own um, they're a good option on really gross days if you're like i just you know don't want to feel miserable out there so i'm gonna wear a gore-tex shoe but i'm not a huge fan of them 
Um, so yeah, but a trail shoe, like a fast trail shoe. And, then, and I feel lots of brands have that in between like ridiculous trail or runnable trail. I, I've, I haven't, I don't have a lot of experience with like yak tracks and, and micro spikes and things like that. So I'm, I, I'm not even going to uh, give my opinion, uh, but I know they exist. And since they exist and since there's a big market for them, I'm assuming that they're somewhat beneficial, but I, I have not run to them. I've not run to myself, so I can't really speak to that. But, uh, right. Great. I've seen a couple of videos of uh, some some track runners like fully spiking up and going out and doing some hard runs in their spikes, which, you know, may not be the most advisable thing, but anything just to get a little more grip eh, is uh, is really, really helpful this time of year. Yeah, until your Achilles blows up. But well, exactly. Yeah. That's another problem. <laughs> right. But yeah, I, I know what you're saying, though. Like, I, I've seen people do that, right? And you'd be like, is that person wearing this? I was like, you get the, yeah, idea. Yeah. the concept makes makes so much sense until until like a day and a half later and they're wondering why they can't walk but right right <laughs> ease into everything is, is probably Absolute. a good rule of thumb there 100 percent, 100 percent. okay so we're geared out we're in the right stuff we're heading out the door now and i think you know you you started to speak to this earlier about adjusting some of the the expectations around metrics but i think that's one of the biggest pieces here is adjusting not only your expectations but also actual workouts so maybe you could speak to that a little bit more about again, like changing some of the, the ways that you measure success when you're out on a winter training run, and then also maybe some of your favorite winter workouts for various nasty conditions. Yeah, I think, I think especially when I do my winter training with athletes I'm working with, um, a lot of it is, is more time-based rather than distance-based, and it's more effort-based rather than speed-based. So like, it'll be more along the lines of like, you know, do five by five minutes at starting at half marathon pace, working down to 10 K pace. Right. So uh, if you're a newer runner, it can be hard to establish what is 10 K, what is half marathon. Right. So you can look at the overall workload, say, oh, okay, I have 25 minutes worth of work. I want to, and the goal of this workout is to get 25 minutes of work. So use the first repetition to kind of get a sense of the time you're, you're dealing with and like what a five minute interval looks like and spreading out your effort over the, over that five minutes and then to be able to repeat it after five times. And it's nice to have, clarification on what the purpose of the workout is right is this is this something are we working vo2 max where we really want to go hard and we really want to jam and every interval is want to be super intense or is it more of like a threshold cruise tempo session where you want to feel controlled you want to feel fast you want to be putting in an effort but you're not going to be giving an all-out effort right so having a clear understanding of what you're looking to accomplish of the on the day and then being able to set your metrics to to be aligned with that um, and just being able to tune into your body and based off RPE more than anything. Um, I feel like RPE is such a valuable thing. And it, even, even like when you have good weather, like I like to use the watch as a tool rather than like the thing, right? Your body is the thing. Your body is in charge. Your watch is going to give you information, but your body is running the show, right? So being able to cue in on how your body is feeling and using RPE and using effort, um, that's a great way to do it. And that's a way to like, if you finish your run and you're like, okay, I know I ran hard. I, I was in the zone I wanted to be in effort wise, then prob you probably got a pretty good stimulus out of it, right? Like that's what training is. It's adding, a it's adding a stimulus to the body and allowing it to respond and adapt and get better. So if you went out there and you worked hard, you put in a good session, times don't matter. We'll worry about time later. We'll worry about time when, when, when you can get on the track and have some accurate, you know, measurements. It's crazy. Like I, I like, we would do this all the time. It's like you go out there and you spend a winter just putting in hard work, putting in hard work, putting in hard work. You get on the track, you're like, holy crap, like I'm fit. The first ever time I went under eight minutes in the 3K, I did one track workout before just to get like a sense of what a 64 second lap felt like. But everything else was done on the trails, running hard, fart lick on the trail with no, no mm -hmm. sense of, because GPS didn't exist back then because I'm old. Um, <laughs> I, didn't have, I didn't have a GPS watch, right? I just had a watch. Like I'm going to run five minutes hard and then I'm going to take two minutes easy and I'm going to run five minutes hard. And you get fit that way. It's just based on mm -hmm. effort. And just to just to clarify there, RPE, that's rate of perceived exertion. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And, 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 everybody's, and everybody's going to be different in that regard also, right? So that's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some person, some, someone's six out of 10 is going to be different. Someone else is six out of 10. But trying to like, trying to find your own range and what works for you. And this time of year, it's all about just putting, it's, it's more important to put in the volume of work than the quality of work per se, mm -hmm. you know, err on the side of caution as you're working into a session. I would much rather an athlete go out there and get like, you know, 
I would rather them finish a workout and be like, you know what? I think I could have gone harder rather than being like, I went, I blew up and I, and I don't know. Right. So it's, it's definitely yeah. just, it's building work upon work upon work. Not any one workout you do during the winter or ever is going to be the thing that gets you to where you want to be. It's going to be a collection of weeks and months and years of building upon building upon building. And as you mm -hmm. do that, you'll learn yourself as an athlete and you'll just get fitter. Right. And you had, you had mentioned, I know it was kind of a joke in that you didn't have access to GPS when you were, you know, in your younger training years, but I'm wondering if there's something to that, like leaving the Garmin or the GPS watch at home and instead just going with, you know, your, your old little Timex or something. Like, is that something that you do yourself or suggest that others do? Yeah. You know, I think it's a beautiful in, in the simplicity of it. Right. Because I feel like, especially nowadays, we're just inundated with so many things. It's like, well, use this to track, use this to track, use this to track. These are all tools. And at the end of the day, your body, like I said, your body's in charge. And I know Hoffbauer was a big fan of that. He kind of ditched the watch. I know other examples of athletes who have ditched the watch. Mm -hmm. You know, when you go to Kenya and Eton and they're doing fart lifts on the roads, I reckon not a lot of those guys are looking at splits on their watches, right? They're just running, right. they're just putting in the work necessary. So there is some something charming about the simplicity uh, as long as it's something you're able to mentally process. Because mm. sometimes it's like, you know, throw away the watch. Don't run with your watch. You spend the whole run stressing about not having a watch, right? <laughs> right. So we're, every athlete's different in that regard. And it's because it, you're training yourself mentally and you're also training yourself physically. And if mentally you're going to be stressed out about not having that metric, then it's probably maybe not for you. But for myself, yeah, I, I love just going out there and just like putting on the running time. Like I'm going to run for an hour. And within this mm -hmm. hour, I'll do some two minutes or some pit pickups or some hill work right and and you can get fit, you can get pretty fit from that yeah definitely and so you know you had talked about the importance of kind of prioritizing volume over over quality um especially on a really cold days because you know you, you, the worst thing would be to like pull you know again like the achilles or have something go wrong just because the conditions are so terrible um but you know the other thing that we've talked a lot about in the past is making sure that even if you're training for a marathon or a long event that you are still getting a little bit of speed work in on a fairly regular basis what are some of the ways that you can without necessarily hitting a track or you know right now we don't have any indoor facilities available to us so what are some of the ways maybe on a slightly warmer you know dry day where you could get in some speed work during the winter in a safe yeah. way yeah um well I, I strides are always always great and like you said yes speed is going to be beneficial no matter what distance or what or what event and right obviously your training is going to be aimed towards what your ultimately your goals are um but there's always a there's always a room for for speed i think hills especially this time of year hills are excellent excellent speed work the bang for your buck you get from hill work is incredible it's a uh, when you're doing them, you, you hate everything, but they're so good for you. And, and, and you can get fast from doing hills, you know, and like, you know, again, like 40 second hill sprints, 90 seconds, right? The difference of the hill is going to depend on the effort. But if you go and do like 20 second hill sprints, that's a pretty darn, you can get some really good speed generated from that. Really get, really get some good power going. Um, str strides um, at the end of a run, just focusing on form, focusing on feeling good. And even, even just shorter fartlek sessions, the classic mana fartlek such a good workout it's 20 minutes you know if you don't know what the monofarlic is it's it's 90 seconds on 90 seconds off 90 seconds on 90 seconds off one one anyways it adds up to be 20 minutes and it, on paper it looks easy until you do it and you're in your third one minute and you're just like oh this is awful right so right. just and focusing on you know feeling fast feeling smooth um, moving well when you're doing your speed work this time of year it's all about just kind of getting your body moving in a way that feels good and I like speed work or like shorter fart lick because in a minute interval, you don't really have much time to look at your watch and see what pace you're doing. You're just like, get a minute done, run hard right. for a minute. You know, it's not too specific. So yeah, it's uh, getting your legs turned over in a controlled, safe, smart way and hills, mm -hmm. shorter uh, strides at the end of run or even some shorter, like little hit workouts where you're 20 minutes, minute on minute off type thing. I did that yesterday. Nice. Felt like a awesome. robot, but it was Yeah. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of fart like lately as well. Um, and one of the things I like about it is depending on where you're running, of course, but I think most people are running in places where there is a little bit of undulation. And so the mm -hmm. great thing about the fart like is you never know what you might spend, you know, 30 seconds of that minute hard going uphill and exactly. you won't know that till you're in it. Right. And so change that, that kind of inherently changes the stimulus as well, I think. Absolutely. And doing stuff like that will get you more comfortable and familiar with being able to trust your body. 
and mm-hmm. being like, oh, you know, I'm just, just run hard, whatever, whatever you come across, just run hard. Right. And, right. And, and, your, and your body's going to adapt to that stress and you're going to be a better runner as a result. Don't think you're cheating because you're running downhill. Don't think you're, <laughs> don't think you're, you know, you're uh, whatever the, up, it's, it's, it's all going to come out in the wash where it's mm-hmm. effort based, you're moving fast, you're working hard and you're, you're teaching your body that stimulus. So sure. you're be better for it. And just while we're on the note of fartleks, because I think this is such a great winter workout, what sort of difference should people be looking for in the effort between the hard and the easy sections? You know, if you're doing that 20 minutes of 90 seconds hard, 90 seconds easy, approximately what percentage of your overall effort should both of those be? Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, it, it again, depends on the volume of work, because obviously you got to spread out your volume of work across the, across the workout. Um, I usually start my fire lift where the first few reps are going to be the slowest on the day with the aims of the last few being the fastest on the day. I use the first few reps as almost like a warm up rep. So say, say I'm doing one minute. So if I do one minute, I'm going to often do those starting at 10 K effort and hopefully maybe working down to five K effort, but kind of starting at 10 K effort. If I'm doing five minutes, I'll start probably around half marathon effort. Right. So it's effort based. And if you look at like, um, and then, but the easies and the offs, um, oftentimes I'm just, at least, at least like a minute a kilometer slower um based on the prescription of the workout because sometimes you cruise that in between but that's a little more advanced but on the offs on the offs it's all about getting your heart rate down it's all about just keeping moving bringing that heart rate down some people can walk the offs and that's fine mm-hmm. if, if you need to walk the offs to keep you being able to hit a good effort on the on right you don't right. want the recovery to be compromising your on too much you see it all the time at the track where it's like people will you know, 400 on, 200 off, and they'll just run the 200. It's like, take the rest. The rest is there for you to take. <laughs> the rest is good for you, right? Because the work is being done during, you know, I mean, the fast work is being done during the on, but also there's work mm-hmm. being done during the off as you're bringing your heart rate down. So allow your body to make that switch of like, okay, now we're recovering. Now we're going hard again. Now we're recovering. So right. just, I, 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 when I, when I do, when I do fart like, like that, I'm just like, take, take, take the easy, as easy as you can. You cannot go too easy on the easy unless I say otherwise. Right. <laughs> well, and the other thing I find with those fart legs is they're actually great for the really cold days where it's sometimes actually detrimental to have like non-active rest in between intervals because you just get too cold. Like yep. we had a workout um, last week when I think it was about minus 12 here in Toronto. And, it, it, and for that very reason, it was actually great. I think some people mentally would think, oh, I'd rather just stop entirely because again, mentally that's easier than keeping moving the whole time, but it actually keeps that circulation going and it keeps you warmer so that your muscles and everything don't, you know, lock up for the next interval. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. 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 Keep that core temperature warm. And there's something to be said about like being able to bring your heart rate down while you're still moving and not mm-hmm. just stopping because that's going to happen for example in a race right when you get to the top of a hill you're going to be exerting more effort at the top of the hill your heart rate's going to go up but when you get to the mm-hmm. top you want to continue to run off the top of the hill and your body's going to want to be able to bring that heart rate down and calm down while you're still moving so mm-hmm. the more you do your fart lick and the more you get familiar with it then it is time to be like you know on your off don't completely shut it off Keep mm-hmm. moving and allow your body to get used to that sensation of recovering on the go type thing. Um, because right. racing, racing is like, sometimes there'll be a surge. Sometimes you got to drop somebody, right? Sometimes when you're, right. when you're truly racing, it's like, I'm going to drop this person. And then, you know, you recover a little bit as you're still moving type thing. Mm-hmm. I was going to ask you if that had ever been the case where you're in a race and you decide to throw in a surge and you're like, man, I'm glad I did all those fart legs through the winter. <laughs> hundred percent. It's, it's, cr- it's crazy because sometimes like, it's just, just, putting your, taking your foot off the gas just a little bit allows you to collect yourself and recover. Mm-hmm. Uh, I used to, you know, through my marathon training days, we'd, we'd often have on off kilometer repeats where it'd be like the on isn't as on as it would be, but the off's not as off either. It would be mm-hmm. like, you know, the on would be at half marathon where the off would be at like that plus 30 seconds. So it's mm-hmm. not a complete off. It's more of a strength session. It's almost like a, it's like a tempo run essentially, right. but it, you know, it allows you to teach your body to recover while you're still moving at a decent pace. Great. Be well, these are all tactics. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, again, there's there's the mental side of all of this too, which is just you know continuing to build up that mental toughness and strength as well. So these are great workouts, Rob. Um, I'm wondering now about the days where, you know, again, we've talked about like character building and how winter running makes you so tough. And I think as Canadians, we sort of revel in that a little bit because we don't really have much choice in the winter other than to just go out. But when should you just avoid a run entirely 
and perhaps, you know, do a cross train session or do a little at home hit workout instead? Like when, when is it just not a good idea to get out the door? Yeah, I, I guess you got to do like a risk reward analysis or SWOT analysis or something like that. Just talk businessy. Um, it's just if it's not going to be safe, if it's not going to be productive, if the potential, if the potentials negatives outweigh the positives, then it's probably not a good idea to do it. Right? If you're out there and it's a hailstorm or a nice storm, it's like what kind of benefit are you actually going to get from this run? Right? There are days where it's like it's cold and it's snowy, but you can still run you're still going to get in a good run, but when it's not safe or it's just not practical or it's just not going to happen, sometimes, sometimes you got to take an L in the day. And that is fine because again, it goes back to running, being a body of work and not one, any one session. So, and a lot of times, a lot of times runners are just chronically overworked because we tend to be a little bit type a. So we're going to just put in work, put in work, put in work. We're all about putting in more work, putting in more work, putting in more work. And then you take a few days off. You're like, oh, I feel great. You're like, why do you feel great? It's because you're recovered, right? So it's okay. It's okay. I promise you, it's okay to take some days off. If it's if if you risk hurting yourself or you risk injuring something, just don't do it. You got to be smart, right? You got to, you got to, the, all the winter is all about getting to that spring season ready to really jam. Right. Awesome. Okay. So on those days where you can't get outside, it's just not safe. You've made that, you know, you've called the audible, you've made that decision for yourself. Um, understanding that currently a lot of gyms are closed. So that's not always an option. And probably, you know, many people don't have necessarily at home cross training equipment. Let's maybe break that into two. So let's say you do have access to a bike or an elliptical or, you know, maybe a treadmill, which would be amazing. But in the cross training realm, how would you translate a run or a workout that you were supposed to do outside into a cross training environment. Yeah, if if you can get onto an uh, an elliptical or a bike or something aerobic like that, um, some days you're just like I'm just going to spin um, at an aerobic level and just put in an hour, which is fine or, or whatever. If you want to do a specific session, um, you can you can you can kind of replicate the fart lick on your bike, right? So it's like, okay, I was gonna do two minutes or say, all right, I'm gonna get on the bike. I'm gonna spin for 15 minutes to get my legs warmed up. I'm gonna do a couple strides because I don't ride my bike very often. So I don't know what the hell I'm doing type thing. And just get a sense of how, what you're doing and then, and then go in. And, and, and this goes back to that, the benefits of being able to go RPE because then you can translate like, what would this effort be like on the bike? It's like, okay, I know what that RPE is. Um, obviously it's, 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 you can't get the identical stimulus and then, you know, obviously be like, all right, well, if I want to get a still the same benefit of an hour run, I'm going to bike for three hours. It's like, that's not, that's not, that's not possible. But if you want to do some work, like a nice little, nice little hit, uh, the good thing about the bike is they're super low impact. So you're not going to beat yourself up too much. Um, so yeah, it's just like, you can take a session and just break it down into time and then do those same intervals on an elliptical on a uh, or on a bike or even on a treadmill if you got a treadmill which is great um i find when i do cross training stuff like that i want to do a workout because i get really bored really easily and it's easier to like bike an hour with structure than just to spin your legs for an hour totally yeah I, i know that most pools are closed right now but when i was doing some cross training in the pool like pool running it was the same thing i would because and and again there's no impact so it's not going to really beat you up but i would do workouts every single time i was in the pool because i couldn't fathom going an hour straight of just (laughs) back and forth in that deep end so yeah that's great mentally too yeah Um, it's 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 nice and what about if you don't have access to a piece of cross training equipment what are some of the other like either for yourself or if you've been prescribing it for others that you coach what other sort of creative ways can people still get some physical benefit at home with let's say minimal equipment um, that'll still kind of like continue building some of that overall strength towards their spring race goals yeah so i i I feel like most athletes should be incorporating some sort of supplementary work in their routine or in their in their in their training anyways um so it's kind of like identify areas of improvement that will help you and if it's something you're doing on a consistent basis because like anything like this like some days you're just doing something to appease your mind and it doesn't really have a a long-term benefit to it you're doing it so you don't go crazy on that day but a lot of times when you're doing the supplementary work it's 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 steady and consistent um so you know having that yoga having that mobility having that core work right it's it's what you're comfortable doing and something you've done in the past 
you don't want to be like, Hey, I can't run today. I'm going to try this whole new thing. Right. And you do a bunch of squats and the next day you can't walk because you've got the craziest doms. So I guess it's another opportunity just, okay, well, I was going to do cross training on Thursday anyways, I'll just do it today type thing. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a million billion resources out there these days because everybody's switched to that digital platform. So you can Google, you know, core work for runners and you'll have a million options. Mm -hmm. um, and again, but doing something and movements that you're familiar with and not trying to all of a sudden start something new. It's like, okay, I'm going to do, I should do some squats. And it's crazy because you'll do squats and you'll do like, if you haven't been doing them and you're like, I'll do three sets of 10, you, it feels like nothing. And then like, you can't sit down for three days. <laughs> <laughs> right? So something you're, something you're comfortable with, something you're familiar with, something you know is beneficial for you. And it's kind of can be purposeful and complementary to your training. And it's mm -hmm. going to make you a better runner on that day, given the circumstances. If you can become a better runner on that day, become a better runner on the day. And sometimes becoming a better runner is taking a day off and recovering and allowing your body to absorb the work it's already been doing. Right. Yeah. That forced rest, we can all benefit from that for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and so that leads us well into, uh, you know, you had talked about the importance of incorporating some mobility and some light strength training on a regular basis. Are there any particular movements that you think are especially important to kind of like bulletproof your body during the winter months? Um, any like particular injuries that you see recurring most often that you kind of want to like safeguard against anything like that? That's like winter specific. Yeah, um, I think uh, like a lot of times strength work is uh, is more um, what is it? It's it's, it's uh, proactive, it's proactive injury stuff. It's so you don't get hurt in the first place, and especially in the winter, right? And I find in the winter times you get a little bit more overuse injuries on like minor muscle groups. Um, you'll see it a lot in like the ankle joint and the ankle tendons because you're running on that uneven terrain. You know, every step. If you're a trail runner, you're probably fine. But if you're more, if you're used to being a road runner. So doing some, you know, some foot and ankle mobility, making sure your, your calves and your soleus and all those are strong. But um, whenever I talk to runners about strength training, it's, it's always a lot of glutes and hips and hamstrings because those are the biggest muscles in your body. And you want your biggest muscles in your body to be strong and to be doing what they're supposed to be doing. I get I, every one of the reasons I moved from, from Ontario to Vancouver is I've got finicky hamstrings on the best of times. But in the winter my hamstrings would always go because those little slippings, the little slips, little slips, they add up. Right. And the muscle is, is experiencing a, a movement or a stimulus that it doesn't necessarily familiar with or like. So just trying to make that muscle as strong as you can to handle the rigors of having a little bit of non uniform foot plants or non uniform gait. Right. Um, so glutes, hamstrings, keeping your hips loose, um, deadlifts, one-legged squats, doing one-legged squat, doing one-legged stuff I find is really important for runners because if you look at a gait cycle, there's no time when you're running that both feet are on the ground at the same time, right? So doing one-legged stuff because even if you're doing two-legged stuff, which is great, it's great for foundation. If you're new to it, maybe doing the two-footed stuff, but you know, we're all a little bit unbalanced, right? You, you will all have a, we'll all have a stronger side. We'll all have a side that feels better than the other side. So trying to keep things as balanced as possible and by doing one legged stuff. And it's not all about weight sometimes, right? If you're, if, I mean, weight training has its own specifics, right? If you're looking for power and to sprint better, yes, maybe you are looking for more weight or if you're looking for some more running economy, yes, more weight. But if you're looking for resiliency, it's more just reaffirming those, those proper muscle movements and those muscle patterns and those firing patterns. Um, so yeah, so like squats, deadlifts, um, hamstring curls, uh, things like that. Right. And I don't know about you, but I've found that, um, one of the little silver linings to COVID has been that because I'm home so often, I actually enjoy getting up once every, you know, hour and a half or so, and maybe spending 10 minutes on just a little bit of mobility or just picking up, you know, whatever it is, a, a, a full jug of milk and doing some single leg deadlifts or something like that, just because it helps you kind of mentally and physically get out of the, the repetition of our day to day where we're kind of in, in groundhog day right now. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. Right. And a lot of people have that where it's, it's, it's like, you'll, you'll spread your workout over the day. And I have that same thing when, when I'm working upstairs, I have my yoga mat out with like some kettlebells. And it's like, every time I walk nice. by, I'll knock out some push ups or some something, right. Just to, to, right. again, to, to do it. And another thing I, I should note is that hip flexors at the front of your hips in the winter are very, also very, very important. Um, just because those are those drivers. And um, I find with hamstrings, my hamstring uh, 
they got the best is when I really put a lot of work into keeping my, my hip flexors at the front of my leg nice and loose. Um, but yeah, but like you were saying, right, we, we are working from home and we do have to be a little more, you know, flexible and, and thinking outside the box, but we do probably have time, um, right. to do, to do those things that can help improve your running. So just finding a routine and finding things that work for you that you're actually going to do is, is super important, right? If you're, mm-hmm. if you're, if you're going to have to get really worked up to do an hour of stretching and mobility that or you could do it, you know, in 20 minutes. It's, if you're gonna do the 20 minute or more, do the 20 minute, right? It's, it's right. all about doing the damn work rather than, doing, right. rather than like writing in this hour and you're like, oh, I gotta do this hour, I gotta do this hour. It's easy to do 20 minutes. For sure, yeah. Well, and again, speaking about that sort of mental approach to things, I'd like to move now into, you know, the fact that Bell Let's Talk Day was just a few days ago. And as most people will know, this is a really critical mental health initiative, sort of raising awareness and, and some resources around mental health. And I think most of us can agree that this is vital right now. It's probably more important than it's been collectively in a long time for us. What advice do you have around staying positive during these like cold or darker months and ensuring that running continues to be like a positive outlet instead of something that's gonna, you know, add more stress? Yeah. And, and that's, and that's a great point. And it's something that's very important is, uh, is keeping that, keeping that mindset or that acknowledgement or just like, why are you running? What is your why of running and, and, and repurposing when this, when this pandemic first started, it was, it was very interesting because obviously I'm, I'm a coach. So I, I'll talk to people. I'll be like, where does running fit in with this right now? Because there's so much uncertainty. There's so much going on. And it's, and it's a scary time for a lot of people. And a lot of people are like, I need my running because my running is my connection to normal. My running is the area of my life where I can control. My running is my outlet. A lot of people's specific goals may have gone away. And then they viewed running or they, or they found a new appreciation for running in a, in a different way. And it's being able to check in with that. Like before you get out of the door, it's like, why are you running? What is your why today? And, and keeping that first and foremost. And some people are still, I'm training for this goal. And I know to get this goal, I have to do this work. Or when it's dark out, it's like, you know, it's just keeping, yeah, like you were saying, it's like keeping running as a positive outlet in your life and not just another thing lumped on top of all the other stuff we have going on, all the other stresses we have going on. It's like, what role does running play? And for a lot of people, running is their way to express themselves or to, to move on the day or to have some free time, right? It's just like, what is your why and keeping your purpose and your reason for getting out the door to, you know, to reflect that. And sometimes it can be coming overloading and sometimes it can be like, oh, I have also all this going on and I still, I still have to get my run going on. And if the rest, if that run is causing you stress and you could be more benefited on that day by not running, that's okay that's okay. You do not have to run every single day. What you have to do every single day is do what's best for you as a person. We are athletes, but more importantly, we're people and we have lives and running is part of our lives, but it's not our lives. There's other things going on and you have to do what's best for you. Take care of yourself first and foremost. And a lot of times running is a a way to enhance that and clear the clutter, but sometimes it's not. And it's okay to take a day. It's okay to take a personal Mm -hmm. day. I've taken them. I'm sure everyone's taken a few yeah. more this year, but that's okay because you know you'll get it, you'll get it back out there eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, great, great words of, of advice, Rob. I, I appreciate that a lot. And you know, it kind of goes back to a lot of these other themes you've talked about, whether it be like forced rest physically on a day where you just can't get out the door um, because the, the conditions don't allow for it, or making sure that, like you said, you have that long-term approach to your your training and your overall well-being, and making sure that like the consistency is there, right? Because we all know what it feels like to be burned out or to for running to shift into this thing that is more of a, a need instead of a, a want. And then that's going to probably interrupt your consistency long-term as well, because you're just not going to enjoy it as much. So great yep. advice. <laughs> really yeah, appreciate and, that. And also, you know what? Runners love talking about running. Um, so lean into your community, um, lean into your training partners, lean into, you know, a positive, a positive online community. Um, and, uh, you know, it's because all I, I can I can promise you we we've all right we've all ride that wave there's ups mm-hmm. there's downs there's there's times where I the last thing I want to do is go for a run um 
and that's normal and that's fine. So, you know, it's like, it's like sharing your experiences with others can help because you're not alone and you're not the only one feeling like this, especially in the winter, especially due to COVID. So talking to other people and sometimes this talking is going to help you just clear it, clear it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Have you guys been um, engaging in any new like initiatives or community building stuff with Mile to Marathon during the pandemic that kind of looks different from the way it did when you were doing in-person training and, and uh, coaching? Yeah, we try to have more like um, unstructured, like just time to connect, right? We'll have like a Thursday afternoon call or like a Sunday afternoon call where it's like open to everybody. We're not necessarily going to talk about training. We're just going to connect and, and see each other because something training, being a coach for a big group like that is you see the social implications of it and the, and the positive social implications that come with seeing your, your group and seeing your people and seeing the people you train with because it's like a you know, it's, it's something that it's a lot of people's social outlet, especially like, you know, people in their twenties and thirties and forties. And, you know, it's like, we don't have school to go to, you know, and work to work. And, uh, you know, so the running can be their social outlet. So we try to provide those, you know, having some zoom calls and just trying to be more communicative and, uh, yeah, because it's, it's things that we can't get together. And I miss, I miss the people I coach seeing them face to face and being able to give them a high five after a solid mm -hmm. session or, give them a pat on the back after a not so solid session either way right yeah. it's just the, the interaction that community interaction so yeah with mild marathon we're doing some zooming and and trying to provide more stuff like that we do like we do a group zoom core workout on monday night type hmm. awesome that's great glad to hear yeah. that well Go again i'm sure i'm sure your athletes miss you as well and uh we're all looking forward to a time when we can have that in-person community again and so on that note um these have all been great great tips great pieces of advice rob um understanding that we're not sure exactly where this thing is going what are you excited about both with mile to marathon and with your own personal running over the next you know coming weeks and months oh geez with mile to marathon i'm, I'm looking i mean i've been really really impressed and uplifted by the people by athletes commitment to the sport with specific goals taken away or specific races taken away people's appreciation for the sport has shown through and it's uh, like i i I'm, I'm a running lifer i've it's played such a huge part of my life and sometimes i think i'm a little strange at how much i like running and but then seeing how i thought i thought when this pandemic started people are just gonna stop but it's been the opposite. People have really leaned into it. And it's been really cool seeing the positive, the positive mental and physical tool that running can be during these tough times, which is awesome. And with Miles Marathon, I, 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 get, I, just, I just like working with athletes who can share that passion and just want to better themselves. And it's not always about time. It's more about experience and it's, it's more growth than just a, a time on your watch. So I look forward to continue to work with my athletes to work through this together um and with my own running it's just you know every every run's different these days just getting out the door and going for a run to clear my head after a day or having I, like i love running fast i love the feeling of running fast it's not as fast as it once was but it's fast to me now it's, it's fast to now rob right uh so i don't have any specific goals per se i have to get uh i have to in the next couple months i want to go under 15 minutes for a 5k because i have a streak i have a streak going i've done it 15 years in a row so i want to get yeah my, I want to get my six, but three minute K's are getting harder every year. I'll tell you that much. <laughs> Holy moly. I, I did. I did my first sub three minute K the other day and it was a freaking full on sprint. So I got a little bit of work to do, but I'll get there. I'll get there. And it's a, it's a fun challenge. Absolutely. And I know there's a lot of like streaks like that happening yeah. right now, but so 2021 would be 16 years consecutively of a sub 15 minute 5k. Yes, it would be. Yeah. That's awesome. So, Very yeah. cool. Yeah. Yes. Well, I, I know that this was possibly said in jest, but I, I couldn't help but noticing recently you tweeted um, a little sort of Easter egg, I guess, about how all six uh, world major marathons are going to be contested within a six week span. And I think you tweeted something like, how does one go about competing in all six of these in a six week span? <laughs> how, how much uh, how much excitement can we have around you potentially taking on a challenge like that? You know what, if it was safe and responsible, and 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 I could do it in, in in such a way I would I would I would do it I would sign up today because I'm I'm through my I'm I'm past my fastest days but I still love the sport and I still love challenges and I just like doing cool stuff and to me like there's no more positive place in the world than a start line or the finish line of a world marathon major and and 
the start line, you have that anticipation, you have that excitement, everyone's there, it's a coming together. During the, during the race, you have the crowds and everyone's so, you know, uplifting. And the finish line, you have that sense of accomplishment. It's just the whole process of a marathon is a beautiful thing. And the world marathon majors do it best. So if there could be a fun little challenge, like going and doing them all, that'd be fantastic. And I would, and I also like trying to run fast. So I would have some performance goals in there. Right. Um, but if I could do it, I would do it hundred percent. I mean, and I'd also have to find some people to take my flights because I'd also go bankrupt and maybe, right, get, yeah. maybe, maybe get divorced. If, if, <laughs> <laughs> well, don't do that. <laughs> within, within, within reasonable means, within reasonable means, I would, right. I, would, I would, I would do it for sure. Awesome. Well, uh, whatever you have coming up on the calendar, I know you're going to have a lot of uh, fans and support behind you. So we're excited for whatever that looks like. In the Thank meantime, you. we have one uh, fan question here. When is Rob bringing back the Rob Watson podcast? Oh, geez. Well, I, I, was, I loved, I loved podcasting, but now it seems like everyone and their brother has a podcast. Um, I do do the mile to marathon. I host the mile to marathon podcast. Um, where I, I talk with members of the mile marathon coaching staff or the mile to marathon community. Um, it doesn't have Spence who was the real star of the podcast. Um, so, I mean, if you want, if you want a little bit of podcasting, you go to the, you can go to the mile to marathon podcast. Uh, but I have no plans to bring back my own podcast. It's, uh, I don't have enough going on. I don't have enough exciting running stuff going on. It's like, Hey, I, oh, I don't a- believe that. <laughs> probably more like not enough time you got you got so many things going on well um folks can check that out of course by visiting mile and then the number two marathon.com mile to marathon.com you can find out more about rob and about all of their amazing coaches there you can find the podcast and there's also a great uh mile to marathon guide to winter running in the blog section there i think going back maybe a year ago or so but with some great uh sort of distilled pieces of advice that rob gave us today so check out mile to marathon.com for more info and uh, Rob, how can folks follow you on social media? Um, they can, I don't know my Instagram, R, R Watson 26.2 on Instagram, maybe, maybe. Uh, and I'm, I'm on, so yeah, Twitter and Instagram. I don't, I, I haven't figured out TikTok yet. Um, but yeah, so I guess Robbie DXZ on Twitter, uh, or whatever my Instagram is. That's, that's well, I just pulled it up. You're R Watson and then the numbers two, six, and then the word point two. R Watson two, six point two. There you go. There we go. Follow. You'll get lots of pictures of my cats. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining us today, Rob. This has been great. And we hope that you enjoy the rest of your uh, day, your sunny day in Vancouver. And um, by all accounts, I think the groundhog did not see his shadow, which means we're supposed to have an early spring. So we can hopefully look forward to that. But um, wishing you and your team the best of luck. And thank you again for sharing your expertise with us today. Okay, it was it was my pleasure. It was all it's always great to chat with you. Thank you so much for inviting me on. Thank you to everyone who who watched, uh, you know, best of luck to your running. Hopefully you get out for a nice one today. Best of luck to everyone else. And just, yeah, and just remember, you know, uh, just do what's going to be best for you. Put in the work, enjoy the process, and and we're going to get through this together. And we'll have a start line together soon enough. Um, Keep working away, folks. And it's a beautiful sport. It's a beautiful community. And I can't wait to see you all in person. Awesome. Thanks so much, Rob. Um, again, you can check him out at miletomarathon.com. And as a final remember from final reminder from your Canada Running Series crew that you can register now for the Under Armour Spring Runoff and for the Banque Scotia 21 km de Montréal virtual races, head over to canadarunningseries.com to find out more and register. In the meantime, thank you so much for tuning into Runners High. You can tune back in two weeks from today for our next session. And until then, stay safe and healthy and we'll chat again soon.